Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Being that it's the time of year for color changes and stories of forgotten lore, I decided that I would take you on a tour of an old Iron Master's home that is regarded as one of the most haunted houses in America. Welcome to the Baker Mansion of Altoona, PA. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. I hope you enjoy this story of the Baker Mansion. I'd like to politely request that you stop finding my channel by accident. By clicking subscribe, you will see these videos when they are released and it will stop you from becoming cursed by spirits that may haunt you after watching this exploration. In 1811, the second iron furnace of Blair County, Pennsylvania was built by Robert Allison and Andrew Henderson. The furnace operated for seven years before going out of blast and sat vacant for 18 years until two men of Lancaster County came out this way to seek the iron rush of central Pennsylvania. Born Frederick and Margareta Baker of Peckway Township in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on December 24, 1798, Elias Baker grew up to become a prominent merchant and distiller of whiskey. Seeking to escape the new tyrannical regulations set forth after the Whiskey Rebellion, Elias Baker got together with his cousin, Roland Diller, and settled into a venture of becoming Iron Masters and moved into the Pennsylvania wilderness, chasing the iron. In March of 1836, Baker and Diller executed purchases of the Allegheny Furnace and the 3,300 acres surrounding this furnace for $50,000. In April of that same year, Elias, his seven months pregnant wife, Esther Rebecca Woods, nicknamed Hetty, and one of his two sons, Sylvester, left on an arduous 170 mile wagon journey into the Allegheny wilderness to start a new life. A journey so treacherous that Elias stated in a letter to his son, David, they even broke a spring on the carriage. Although clarity on the matter is not present, I mention one of Elias' two sons, Sylvester, their other son, David, who was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, was currently 13 years of age and attending boarding school. In June of 1836, their daughter Anna was born, and just three years later, in January of 1839, another daughter, Margareta, was born. Unfortunately, Margareta would not live to see beyond her second birthday and succumbed to diphtheria on January 14th of 1842. Planned 10 years earlier with sketches and many revisions, Elias devised what in his mental picture of a mansion for a man of great wealth and power should look like. In 1844, he contracted Robert Clay Long, an architect out of Baltimore, Maryland, and after four years of architectural difficulty, a new architect, as well as financial distress to the point of near bankruptcy, the extremely steep price $15,000, or today $424,000, $97.77, the Baker Mansion was finally complete. The mansion is architected in Greek Revival style with 35 rooms and used the limestone and iron from Baker's own furnaces. Like many iron furnace sites, there were multiple portions of the manor beyond the mansion itself. There were work sheds, stables, and pens for the labor animals, a general store, a blacksmith shop, and an extremely large stone barn. Just a short walking distance up the road were the workers' cabins and lots where modern-day Union Avenue now stands. Also, like many iron furnaces, was the method of payment. In order to maintain control over the workers and make it seem as if they were getting more bang for their buck, the workers were typically paid in company script, which could only be used if you were an active worker and could only be spent at the company store or the blacksmith shop. Just above Union Avenue, where the workers stayed, is a small cemetery, hidden just beyond the bluff on the other side of Mill Run and behind modern-day Altoona Mirror newspaper building. It's all that's left to signify that they were once here. Further up the road where Union Avenue connects the Crescent Road is the oldest known standing building in Altoona, the current Woman's Club of Altoona, and directly behind it, the original Allegheny Furnace. Elias's eldest son, David, married a woman by the name of Sarah Tuthill, 
1851 and had a daughter, Louise, in 1852. Two weeks after the birth of Louise, David was killed in a steamboat explosion and his body was unable to be buried because the ground had frozen. As typical of the time, his body was sent back home to Altoona and kept in the ice cellar of the mansion until spring arrived and the ground thawed. On the heels of David's death, his sister Anna was courting with one of Elias's furnace workers who had presented her with an engagement ring. When Elias heard that his daughter was seeking to wed a man below her social status, he essentially forbade her from marrying this man, informing her that he was too poor to provide for her or any potential children, and stated that the ring she received was not even a real diamond. In hearing this, an enraged Anna took off the ring and stated she would prove it to be real and scratched her initials into the glass window pane. This later part is a common mythology and folklore story across numerous states over many years of that time period. Even the governor of Virginia has a similar story. And in this particular instance, not provable fact because there's no window panes at the mansion with and his initials etched into them. In 1861, Elias's youngest son, Sylvester, was drafted to serve in the Union Army during the war between the states. Elias did not want his only remaining son to die in a war, so paid another man to take his place. The furnace continued to operate until 1884 and went out of blast due to economic hardships with iron sales, a situation all too common for all iron workers during this time period, especially in this area. Living in his mansion for 15 years, Elias died at age 65 in the year 1864. Hetty, Elias's widow, remained at the mansion with Sylvester and Anna until her death in 1900. Sylvester nor Anna ever married. Sylvester grew old and eventually needed a cane to get around. It's recorded that in order to gain attention when he was having difficulty, he would bang his cane on the floor to have a servant or Anna come and help him. Sylvester died in 1907 in the single parlor on the first floor of the mansion due to heart failure. Anna died in 1914, willing the mansion to her niece, Louise, the daughter of deceased brother David. Louise did not occupy the mansion and it remained emptied and closed until 1922 when the Blair County Historical Society initiated a lease of the mansion and turned it into a museum. The lasting heirs of the Baker legacy sold off the remainders of their inherited property, which eventually became the Baker Estates, a former suburb and now neighborhood of Altoona. And that is the story of the Baker Mansion, or is it? Let me know in the comments below if you have stories about or surrounding Baker's Mansion and the Blair County area. My research is limited only by the information that people do not share openly. Help me break that barrier and let's share the history and culture of who we once were. The problem we run into is that although the Bakers left the mansion, it's believed by many, their spirits did not. There are many recounts regarding Anna being an old maid who owned a wedding gown and never got to use it. Unfortunately, Anna never owned a wedding gown, and this gown actually belonged to Elizabeth Bell, the daughter of Edward Bell, a prominent businessman and ironmaster who founded Bellwood just seven miles up the road. Elizabeth and Anna were acquainted with each other at a very young age, and allegedly Elizabeth was known to perpetually taunt Anna for being unwed and doomed to die an old maid. For a long time, this unused wedding gown was kept in an enclosed glass display case due to its extreme deterioration and age. Many stories talk of this wedding dress often violently shaking and moving around on its own, as well as the accompanying shoes and parasol. In the same room where the wedding gown was kept, there are stories of a music box that will occasionally play music without being wound. Stories continue regarding an invisible figure that would often be found in the double parlor. Along with drastic cold temperature changes, their visits were made apparent when an imprint of someone lying on the couch would be seen. Sometimes a woman in black, believed to be Hetty, is seen walking in the attic. Another story tells of a woman whose car broke down just out front of the mansion, where I'm at right now, very late at night. She approached the mansion and knocked on the door to obtain some assistance, only to have someone on the other side of the door 
knock back at her. She also claimed she heard them walking around on the other side of the door. Infuriated at someone being so impolite, she decided to go back the next day and give them a piece of her mind, give them a good word or two regarding their actions, only to be informed by mansion attendants that the mansion closes at 5 p.m. And nobody would have been in the building after that time. Perhaps it was Sylvester tapping his cane in order to gain assistance to open the door that night. In the late 70s and early 80s, the mansion installed security pressure pads under the carpeting that would ring the police department if tripped. Multiple officers told stories of when the alarms would go off and when they got to the mansion with their police dogs, the dogs would back away from the location of the security pads. These occurrences were so frequent that paranormal investigations have taken place here at the mansion. And although no photographs or video of anything moving within the mansion were captured, the electronic voice phenomena equipment, or EVP, tell a different story. During one such paranormal investigation sometime around 2006-2007, while in Elias's office on the second floor, and again in the first floor single parlor, the paranormal investigators asked questions while using their EVP equipment and, oddly enough, received answers. A later paranormal investigation by a different team did capture a picture of a reflection in the double parlor's mirror of none other than the wedding gown, which, at that time, was not in the building because it was out for extensive restoration. Some people tell of a scream that comes from a man in the cellar. Perhaps it's the scream of David, whom just before he died on the steamboat had been in a fight with his father Elias, exclaiming he would never return to the mansion. Or maybe it's Sylvester's Union soldier replacement, who is said to have told the child not to go into the cellar while he was on a tour in the building. Many of the tour guides have provided tales of when dusting the rooms and fixing the sheets on the beds, turning around for a moment just to turn back around and find the sheets disheveled again. Another tour guide spoke of closing all the windows and doors that had security features attached to them, and then going downstairs and setting the alarm, only to make it a few feet from the front door to have an alarm going off and looking up to see that a window on the second floor had been opened. In a frightened state, she went back in, ran upstairs, closed the window again, shut the lock so hard to nearly have broken it off, ran back down the stairs, reset the alarm, and went out the front door, only to have the same alarm and same window reopen. Regardless of your beliefs and spirits or things that go bump in the night, the history and beauty of this location is one that should not be missed if you come through central Pennsylvania. Most of the Baker Mansion has been recently renovated to show off the wealth of history in this part of Pennsylvania and escape the imagery of ghosts and haunted wedding gowns. That doesn't mean the spirits have left, nor does it take away the title as one of the most haunted houses in America, nor does it discount the housing of one of the top 10 most haunted artifacts being the satin wedding dress which is now locked away out of people's view. But for whatever reason you dare to tread into the Baker Mansion, just remember, this site and the stories it tells and the ones it doesn't tell are a perfect representation of who we once were. If you haven't already, remember to click on this video's like and subscribe for more odd to see stories and I'll see you on the next video.